join me in giving a rousing Westminster welcome to a man who personifies success, significance, sacrifice, and selflessness, one of the world's greatest men of letters, the playwright, the novelist, the poet, the actor, the social critic, human rights activist, teacher, Nobel Prize laureate, Professor Akinwande Oluwole Shoyinka. Thank you very much. And uh, once again, with all my experience, I actually walked into an ambush. Thank you. <laughs> I titled this a checkpoint on the versus syndrome, with a question mark. A checkpoint on the versus syndrome. By the time you all reassembled here next year, minus a significant portion of the college family, this nation and the world would have crossed a watershed that many had sworn would never be encountered in their lifetime. Yet it happened. It is a lesson that those who will emerge from today's rites of passage, and indeed in any field and wherever else in the world of human endeavor should learn and keep it as an embedded part of their very existence. They should consider it a signpost, a secretive promise, an inspiration. In the immediate, however, it should also serve as a cautionary guide. We should never permit what has been gained, the advances that have been made, to be frittered away through complacency. The stream that flows from the accumulated waters of a watershed should not be permitted to dry up, to be polluted, or reversed to dissipate in arid land. It should flow forward, outward, and irrigate that earth that belongs to and nourishes all humanity, irrespective of gender, race, faith, or age. It should bestow its blessings equally on all dwellers on our common earth. Now, what is that watershed that continues or should continue to hold the mind captive. We shall come to it in a moment. Seven years ago, I made an optimistic declaration regarding that watershed. I stated quite confidently that humanity could claim that it had finally arrived, quite plausibly, at a checkpoint in the dialectics of race. I did not allow my optimism to take me so far as to claim that we had reached terminus that we had embarked upon the final stage of the dialectic, as proposed by poets and thinkers, such as the poet and statesman Leopold Sarasengo, one of the original architects of a movement known as Negritude, roughly translated as the being of blackness. Mind you, Sengo inserted the caveat that firstly, the historically disadvantaged arm of the dialectic, specifically the black race, must commence by obtaining its fullest material and affirmation of self-knowledge as an autonomous reality before engaging on a universalist journey that would, in turn, spell the demise of separatist and thus exclusionist tendency among races, white, European, Caucasian, Melanesian, or Semitic. Hence his formulation, together with another poet and statesman, Amy Césaire the Martin, from the Martinique, and others, hence their formulation of negritude. Nonetheless, within the last decade, the world did witness one of those signal events that implicate a potential end in sight of what I often refer to as the domination of the versus conditioning in human affairs, black versus white, Christianity versus Islam, East versus West, communism versus capitalism, etc., etc. To pronounce an end to the racial vector of that dominant, near instinctive tendency 
the vessel syndrome simply because a member of a once despised, denigrated race, color, and humanity rose to preside over the affairs of the erstwhile gospelers of hateful separatism and racial superiority would simply raise such questions as, why did world tension and class conflict not vanish with the dismantling of the Berlin Wall? Or why did extreme nationalisms not evaporate with the dismantling of apartheid South Africa? Yes, indeed, it is true that the coon of yesteryear was conferred with unique powers over the land of the Ku Klux Klan, a nation that induced the iconic image of a small, diffident, but defined black girl being escorted to school by the Marine Corps to the accompaniment of jeers and spittle from the merchants of hate and prejudice would now be compelled to submit to the decisions that would affect their lives, decisions that would be made by progeny of the original race of that bewildered black girl. Did that thereby terminate the versus approach, the we versus others approach to racial relationships in the United States or elsewhere? The versus is a deep-rooted conditioning to be encountered on global and localized levels, taking such forms as those who are not for us are against us. My enemy's enemy is my friend and other time-warped wisdoms with all kinds of emotive labels. Those who insist that, especially in international interaction and places, citadels of learning and enlightenment, that this need not be so, and for themselves, designations such as race traitors, effete liberalists, woolly-minded idealists, unpatriotic elitist thinkers, and other forms of glib demonizations, all of which are designed to brush aside even the objective assessment of such designations. It remains a marvel that somehow counter notions such as cultural metissage, social hybridity, or more accessibly, rainbow coalition, not only emerged, but became persuasive rallying standards in a number of uh, nations. Despite such bookmarks in the politics and ideologies of race, however, it seemed wise, even at that time, to caution, indeed brace ourselves to the possibility that that very ascension of a racial underdog, a product of the slave continent to dominance in power stakes of a constituency that was built on the backs of slave labor, could trigger, paradoxically, the heightening of that very binary opposition. That possibility was real. We could be overwhelmed, I cautioned, by a latent desire among extremists manifested in numerous ways to ensure the failure of such a mandate and by implication the failure of his race leading to a backlash. We could find this manifested also, again paradoxically, in a tendency to apply patronizing standards in assessing his capabilities, policies, strategies, or eventual achievements. That last, especially for me, would spell the highest form of race denigration, a reinforcement of the versus syndrome couched in the language of condescension. It is difficult to eradicate old habits, especially those that simplify the complexity of human interaction and relationships. Nothing is more cosseting than to subsume naughty social challenges under we versus others, and others are responsible for our failures, etc., etc. It is for this reason that I proposed, and do even till today, as I'm certain do many others, that even that watershed event should be read simply as a checkpoint, filled with limitless potential, but not as terminus. That tendency towards polarization, propelled by automatism, is by no means one-sided. Letting it go is no different from asking a severely handicapped individual to let go of a support or crutch. And in all fairness, where that handicap is the product of collective trauma, of remaining on the receiving end of history, sometimes over centuries, 
no one should be exceedingly surprised. Memory plays a more effective role in judgment, even in the most objectivized issues, far more than most of us are willing to admit. Here's one personal, light-hearted illustration. It took place just after Barack Obama's installation as president. I was at dinner with a long-standing colleague, notorious for his uh, compulsive contumacy. I'd said something along about the possibilities of change, not only in American, but in the global psyche, that will come from the presence of a black man at the head of, arguably this, these days, the most powerful nation in the world. His immediate retort was, what black man? As far as I'm concerned, he's white. He's a white man. Tell me, what is black about him? He has a white mother, and that, I'm afraid, was what we had as appetizer. I chose not to debate, debate him on his own grounds. The palate of Obama's ancestry being, for me, a mere distraction. Since right from the party primaries that ended in his national endorsement, as some of you who follow the campaign rhetoric may recall, race most markedly did not surface as an issue. I was also quite used to my friend's uh, outbursts and had stomach only for the evening's agenda, which was supposed to be dinner. So I replied, oh yes, he's white, if you say so. But I seem to recollect that the commonest description of him has been of African descent. This means that he's of black African origin, a first for the United States. He also has a wife who is indisputably African American. His children are African Americans. And the United States White House, designated as the residence of the first family of the nation, has thus become, by fact of occupation, at least 90% African American household, where, in all likelihood, soul food might even appear on the menu for the first time in American history. <laughs> this, I argued, was what the world would see, the real total world that consists of factory workers, salesmen and women, technicians, economists, theologians, artists, plumbers, dank, bankers, immigrants, legal and illegal, economists, taxi drivers, drug traffickers, truck drivers, Indian and other tribal chiefs, philosophers and futurologists, high school and college students, etc., etc. Even the blind, I swore, would see the incumbency transformation. Now, I demanded, could that possibly fail to affect the psyche of the world or fail to influence, however infinitesimally, a number of acts, decisions, choices, and policies in distant places that would in turn shape the future history of that world? Did that make a difference? Could this perhaps be considered as a small measure of progress? Seven years after are sufficient for me to attempt to answer my own question, but I shall not. Yet it is by no means posed as an academic question, since the answer is embedded in the choice that Americans are presently poised to make. I cite this moment only as an extraction from that unprecedented event of January 2017 as a souvenir for those departing from these grounds, as a memento of their rites of passage, which, like all beginnings, also has an end, a gift that may be overlooked, since it is something in which you all labored to bring about. I was here in the United States during that contest. My lectures took me all over the United States, where I observed the enthusiasm of youth, the spirit of volunteerism in a cause for change. I saw youth slumbering over desks in sheer exhaustion after the day's labor, dashing home for a quick refresher, and then back again an hour or so later to resume. Individually and collectively, they built that watershed and they manned its weir. They brought pride to a nation that had nearly turned into a world pariah. So it is your own gift that you take away with you today that sense of accomplishment together with the testaments of your academic journey. As you are thrown on the job market, always bear in mind your protagonist, 
who will also be join, joining you there on that market in another seven months. And so, whenever you're confronted by seemingly insurmountable obstacles in your own onward journey, always recall that you already possess that armor of invincibility that reads, yes, we can. Thank you very much.